So first we need to differentiate with respect to beta. Um, we also need to set equal to zero. So let's write that and set equal to zero because that will allow us to find our critical points. So basically with this equation here, this x transpose times y minus x beta, x beta, this thing is the derivative of the residual sum of squares with respect to beta. And here we're just setting it equal to zero. Now, this is the first thing is where does this equation come from? And we actually have to do quite a bit of work to get to this. So let's start doing that. So I am looking for a good place to write. That is the one thing about this. Um, actually, what I am going to do is I'm going to write it over here. Okay, so we have What we're trying to do is we're trying to take the, um, we want to, we want to take the, find the derivative of the residual sum of squares. So let's, let's do this. So the residual, first of all, let's understand the residual sum of squares, evaluate at beta a little better. So this, remember, this is equal to, um, y minus x beta transpose times y minus x beta. So now, um, with multiplying um, matrices and adding and subtracting matrices, the algebra works out really nicely. So this is equal, we can basically just um, dis, uh, f multiply this out. So this is going to be, um, we get y, um, first of all, transpose um, works well with addition and subtraction. So this is y minus x beta transpose. So this thing is being multiplied by y minus x beta. Okay, and so now we can sort of just foil this out. So this is y transpose times y, and then we are going to subtract y transpose times x beta, and then we are going to subtract x beta transpose times y and then minus and minus mix plus so we're going to add x beta transpose x beta okay so now what is this so this is going to be equal to y transpose y and then we're going to subtract. So this is y transpose times x beta. And here, so with x beta, let's actually write out what this means. So x, x beta, x is n by p, beta is p by one. So this is going to be an n by one matrix. So that's an, uh, a column vector of length n. So the first entry here is going to be the first row of x time ta taking the dot taking the dot product of the first row of x with beta. So that's going to be let's write this as a so this is the sum from i equals one and this dot product so there are p columns so so beta has p entries so this sum is going to go from i equals one to p and we are going to multiply x, lowercase x. Um, so this is the first row. So it's going to be x1i beta i. And to emphasize here, 
x i so x x i j is going so x i j equals row i column j of uppercase x or uppercase bold x okay just so that that notation is out of the way all right and then um at the bottom of this this is going we start at the first row and then eventually we're going to go all the way down to row capital n so then at the end we'll have sum from i equals one to p x capital n i beta i and then you have everything else in between so we have minus that um <clears throat> So now, this is being, and so then we also have, um, of course, we still have the remaining terms, x beta transpose y plus x beta transpose x beta. Okay, but this thing that I wrote out here, this is x times beta. So that will help us with a lot of the other occurrences of x beta here. So let's write out what, let's expand this even more. So we get y transpose times y. So this y transpose, so this is a row vector, it's one by p. And so basically what we take, we take every, um, take every entry of this vector y and we multiply it by an element of this column vector here. So, and then we add all of those together. So what we end up with is this is going to be, so there's the minus sign there. We have the sum from J equals one to capital N because there are N, capital N entries of the vector Y and we're going to take y sub j and multiply it by um, the corresponding sum in that column vector x beta. So this is sum from i equals one to p. And so this is going to be x j i beta i. Okay, so that's the second term. Now the third term is going to be the exact same thing if you look at it because um, basically instead of y being a row vector and x beta being a column vector, here it's the same thing but x beta is a column vector and y is a row vector. Do I have that backwards? Here x, x beta transpose is a row vector and y is a column vector. Um, and, but when you take that dot product, you end up with the same result. So I'm just going to write this as minus 2 times this sum. All right. And then we're going to add this thing. But this is just x beta. So x beta, so x times beta, this gives you a vector. Again, it looks like this. And when you take it, you're basically taking the dot product of it with itself. So what you're doing is you're just taking each of its entries, squaring it, and then adding all of those together. So what is this going to look like? This is going to be the sum from, let's see here, there are capital N entries here. So it's the sum from J equals one to N. And then the individual entry of the vector is the sum from I equals one to P of x j i beta i. We're going to take this and square that entire thing. Okay, so there. So this is, so this is sort of the residual sum of squares of beta written in a way where we're not, where basically all of the betas are no longer in a matrix form. And that makes this a little easier to work with because now we can go through, let's see, I'm just gonna separate that a bit. Now we can go through and actually figure out how to take, find the derivative of this. So what this means now is, or rather this implies that if we take 
the derivative of the residual sum of squares at beta and, and we take the partial derivative with respect to um, a particular entry of the vector beta because remember beta is a vector so I want to start by taking the partial derivative with respect to a particular um, coordinate of that vector um, and so Basically, what this is, is we're taking the partial derivative with respect to um, beta sub k of this whole thing that we just computed. So, let's start doing that. The y transpose times y, there is no beta in that, so that's just a constant, and its derivative with respect to beta k is zero. Then we have this minus two times this sum, blah, blah, blah stuff. Um, so, the derivative is going to come all, because derivatives can pass through scalars and through sums and everything. Um, and so when you pass it through everything, you end up with the sum from i equals one to p of the derivative with respect to beta, the partial derivative with respect to beta k of x, j, i, beta i. So what are these terms going to look like? Um, so let's, let's just start with, we know that there's going to be minus two sum from j equals 1 to n, y sub j, and then this sum, the partial derivative of that with respect to beta k. Well, we're taking the sum from i equals 1 to p of something times beta i. So when i is not equal to k, that's just a constant. And so the derivative is going to be 0, and it completely goes away. The only place where um, we get something that's not 0 is when we take the derivative with respect to beta k, uh, or when i equals k, and we take the derivative with respect to beta k, and then the, the derivative of beta k with respect to beta k is one, and so we're just left with x sub k, no, x sub j k. So that's what we end up with here. And then we also get this thing as well, and this is the sum from j equals 1 to capital N, and so here we have to remember from calculus that we need to use the chain rule because we have this function of beta which is being squared, so it's sort of like um, this is a composition of functions. It's um, first you have the sum, and then you have the squaring thing. So this, the, the squaring operation is the function on the outside. And so the first thing we need to do is we need to take the derivative of the outside function. So the derivative of x squared is 2x. So the derivative of this sum squared is 2 times the sum. 2 times the sum from i equals 1 to p of x, j, i, beta, i. And then we need to multiply this by the derivative of what's on the inside. So again, that's the derivative of this sum with respect to beta, k. And, but we talked about that previously is that's just x, j, k. So I'd like to keep this on the same line and I can just barely fit it. Okay, awesome. So now what is this? So now let's go back to writing this using vectors. I'm gonna separate that. So this first sum, it's minus two. This sum here, um, we can write this sort of as a dot product. Um, and how would we do that? This is the dot product of Let's see here, so we're taking, a, it's a sum of something times something else, and each of these has like this index that's the same index that we're summing over, and so that's why I'm thinking dot product. So, um, we have all of these yj's, so that would just be the vector y, and then we have these xjk's, and if you take x1k through xnk, that gives you the kth column of the matrix X. And if you remember the notation that we use for columns, we used bold lowercase 
um, script for that. So um, I'm going to write bold lowercase x k transpose times y. Because and, and so because this is a dot product between these, it doesn't really matter which way they're transposed, just as long as the dimensions um, check out. So x k that is in and of its so lo, lowercase bolded x sub k that in and of itself is a column vector. So when we take the transpose, we get a row vector, and y is a column vector. So um, and also let's make sure the dimensions check out. Um, so each column of the matrix capital X bolded has each column has n row and each column has n entries because there's n rows so this is so this x k transpose this is a one by k no one by n row vector and y is a n by one column vector and so the dimensions work out and this will just be a dot product and it just is the exact same as this okay so here's this now here we add Two, the two can come out front and here we also have something now this sum from i equals 1 to p of x j i beta i actually I'm going to write this out in two steps so this is going to be the sum from j equals 1 to capital N and we have x j k here and then this sum here this can be written as a um, dot product so this should just be um, is this just x times beta? Hmm. This doesn't seem... I'm not entirely sure about this. Because something is telling me that the dimensions... No, the dimensions will work out. Because um, this sum here... No, the dimensions won't work out. Let me let me cut let me cut to the chase. This is going to be x sub k transpose times x times beta. And why does this work out? This works out because um, so x k transpose again. This is a row vector um, x beta is a n by p matrix times a p by one row or p by one column vector and so that's going to give us a n by one column vector and so the dimensions of x k t times x beta these two things are going to those two things can be multiplied together and let's make sure that x beta gives us what we want so x times beta the first entry of that is going to be the um, the first row of x um, dot pro taking the dot product of the first row of x with the entries of beta, um, and so that's exactly what. Um, so if you're to write this out, this would be um, this would be a column vector and and first entry would be the sum from i equals 1 to p of x1 i b i or x1 i beta i and then the last entry would be the sum of from i equals 1 to p of x n i beta i and then if you take the the dot product of those things with the with these entries of this row vector which are going to look like um let's see here it would be x1 k x2 k x3 k all the way up to x n k if you take that dot product you'll get exactly this and so this checks out all right so now we can actually do something with this because um, if we think of if we think of what the derivative of rss beta is with respect to beta as a whole um, the entire vector we can sort of think of this as um, like the best way to interpret this is as a 
um, as a vector or a as a column matrix where the first entry is the partial derivative with respect to beta one and the final entry is the partial derivative with respect to beta p. So this is going to be um, the partial derivative of RSS beta with respect to beta one all the way down to the partial derivative of RSS beta with respect to beta p. And then another way of writing this is, so this is going to be um, minus two x one transpose y all the way down. Oh, and well, this is, there's a lot more to write, so let me give myself more room. So minus two x one underline transpose y plus two x one transpose x beta all the way down to minus two x n t y plus two x n t x beta and another way of writing this is by setting this equal to minus 2 x transpose y. I should be, I've forgotten a bunch of underlines here, um, but uh, whatever. Um, plus 2 x transpose x beta and this works out because each of these um, each of these x i transposes this is a th th this is basically just a separate row of the transpose matrix so when you when you put all of these rows together you can it's the same as just taking the entire transpose matrix okay so we have this and if we set this equal to zero, then what we can do is we can, here, so if this equals zero, then that's the same as, um, let's see here, we have, uh, we can divide by two because zero divided by two is zero, so we have zero equals, um, x transpose y plus x transpose x beta underlines here and we can um, factor out the um, we, we can multiply by minus one because whatever um, we're multiplying zero by minus one is zero so we can switch the signs and we can also factor out this x transpose And that should be what we are looking for. Right? Yeah. Zero equals x transpose times y minus x beta. Okay. And then um, let's say we want to solve for beta here. Then um, we have to assume that we can actually... Um, so this is going to be, um, if we move this x transpose x beta to the other side, this is going to be um, x, x transpose x beta equals x transpose y. And if we assume, like they say here, that x transpose x is non-singular, then it has an inverse. And we can write that as beta equals x transpose x inverse x transpose y. Right, so we're done, right? No, technically not. This isn't mentioned in the textbook, but remember, I said this thing about the second derivative. Um, sure, this is... We, we, we setting this equal to zero and finding a, a, um, a unique answer means that there is one critical point. 
But we don't know that that critical point is a minimum. Maybe it's a saddle point, maybe it's a maximum. Um, and so we want to make sure that this is actually a minimum. And so what we have to do is we have to take the derivative, we have to find the second derivative. So let's see here, we have this, this first derivative, um, Let's see here. So let's take the second derivative. Nope, that is not what I wanted. So the derivative of R S S beta, let's say we're taking the second derivative with respect to beta K. I think this is how we write second derivatives. It's been a bit for me. Um, now basically we're just taking the partial derivative with respect to beta k twice. And this thing is equal to, well, what was the first thing? We had this formula up, we had a few formulas up here. Um, basically this first term is going to go to zero because there's no beta involved. The second term is the only thing that really matters. So this is going to be the partial derivative. And now, now let's zoom in because um, I'm gonna be doing a little more writing. So we have the partial derivative with respect to beta k of the first derivative. So remember this was this term was 2xk transpose underline times x beta. All right. And let's multiply this back out. Actually, I could have probably just skipped ahead to this step. Um, because we had written this out in more, more expanded previously. So this is two times the sum from J equals one to N of X J K times the sum from I equals one to P of X J I beta I. Right. This is just um, this is just the definition of how these multiplications work out, and so what will this look like when we take the partial derivative? Um, this partial derivative will come all the way to the inside, and it will just affect here. And so what will happen is in this sum, every term will drop out except for the one term that involves beta k, and that will be when i equals k. So um, that will be that term will be x j k times beta k, and taking the derivative of that with respect to beta k will make the beta k become one, and so we're just left with x j k. So this is two times the sum from j equals one to n of x j k times. Now the thing on the inside is also x j k, so this is just x j k squared. But look, this is and, and by the way, this is this is um, the dot product of so let's see, we're taking j from 1 to n. So this is the kth column. So this would be, technically we could write this out as 2 times xk transpose xk, if we wanted to. Um, but that's not really important. What's important is this step, because what we see is that this is a sum of a bunch of things squared. And if you take any real number and square it, you're going to get a number which is greater than or equal to 0. And so then this sum is going, summing all these things up is going to give you something which is greater than or equal to zero. And so, let's see here. I'm sure you could prove something about how like, um, yeah, so basically this is going to be greater than or equal to zero um, well, actually, columns that are entirely zero sort of mess up. Um, I think those can mess up your models anyways. So um, I'm not really too concerned about that. But basically, the fact that these are greater than or equal to zero means that um, you're not going to run into a situation where you have... Um, it's not going to be concave down. Um, 
So this is truly a local minimum. All right. So we have taken this, we've computed this residual sum of squares. We've found the critical point, which is here. And we've shown that the critical point um, is indeed a minimum. And so this, this formula minimizes this beta. So this tells you um, if you set your beta, so beta is all the parameters of your model. So if you set your parameters equal to this, then that's the best you can do for this model. If you want to, if you're measuring performance of your model by this metric, which is a very natural metric to use because you're just kind of computing the distance between your guesses and the reality. Um, the distance in L2 and things like that, but um, basically like Euclidean distance between um, your guesses and reality. And so that's a very natu natural uh, metric to use. And using that metric, this is the best you can do. Um, so this shows us a few things. First of all, this is noteworthy because it is very rare in um, machine learning and, and, and in mathematics as a whole that you can like, if you, if you if you're given a complicated equation, typically you're not going to find a, this is called like a closed form solution. Basically what this means is this gives you a, a, a collection of calculations that you can do to find the exact value. Um, this is very rare. Um, this is so, and this is typically something that you only see with very simple examples. And indeed this is probably the simplest um, type of predictive model that exists out there. Um, and because it's so simple, that allows us to have an exact solution. Um, and so that is really nice. Um, and it's noteworthy because typically you, typically to try to optimize your model and choose the best parameters, you're never, there's no hope for having a closed form solution. You're just gonna have to sort of like explore around and sort of guess as to when you think you've done good enough at arriving at good enough of a solution or accurate enough of a solution. Um, and so the fact that we actually have a closed form solution is really nice. It means we don't need to do any extra work to optimize these. We just plug in, we just do the calculations. Um, so yeah, there's that. Another thing to note is that this is this sort of goes to show why I wanted to start the series in the first place is that there is a lot of work that we need to do here. Um, now I will say that there are um, I'm not as comfortable or as familiar with doing calculus on vectors, and I'm sure if you are comfortable doing it, then um, a lot of these calculations can be skipped. Like I went into a lot of details, like turning the dot turning these dot product products and matrix multiplications, turning them back into sums. Um, generally, um, there's rules out there to where I think a lot of this is unnecessary, um, but it's helpful to me to write out in this detail um, and to know th that I can understand the details and follow along every single step. Um, and so I hope that's helpful for you as well. Um, and so, yeah, because if like, this is a lot of work and so it's helpful to see someone go through the steps so that you can get a full understanding of why these things work out the way they do and why these equations that just sort of seem to pop out of nowhere, understanding where they come from. So yeah, this and then there isn't really much left for this. They just give an example here um, and then they go on to the next um, type of model. And so that's where we'll pick up. There's one thing that I want to point out here. So I mentioned that th this sum is greater than or equal to zero. And um, we want the residual sum of squares to be, um, we want the second derivative to be strictly positive with respect to every single coordinate because that will guarantee that the function is truly concave up in every coordinate and there's no risk of a saddle point or anything like that. Um, but let's think about this a little bit further. So, um, 
What would it mean for this sum to be equal to zero? Well, we're summing up a bunch of real numbers squared. Um, so if any of these real numbers is not zero, then when you square it, the result will be greater than zero. And so then the sum will be greater than zero. So for any, so if one of these sums is greater, is equal, if one of these sums is equal to zero, that must mean that all of the coordinates of that vector or all of these um, real numbers that we're squaring, all of those must be equal to zero. So let's see, remember xk, so this is um, column k of the vector x. No, column k of the matrix x. So um, if this sum is equal to zero, that means that every entry in column k of the matrix x is equal to zero. But now let's look at this. When we're trying to find um, the unique solution, we know um, it's given by this formula, so long as x transpose times x is non-singular. But if it were the case that we had a column, let's call it xk, which consisted entirely of um, zeros, then when you take this, when you compute this matrix x transpose times x, so x transpose, so if um, column k of x is, contains all zeros, then row k of x transpose contains all zeros. And so when you do the matrix multiplication, um, every time you take the kth row of x transpose and you take its dot product with one of the columns of x, you get zero. And so when you take this, um, when you take this, when you do this multiplication, you're going to end up with a row of zeros. And if your matrix, and, and this is of course a square matrix, um, if you have a square matrix with, with a row of zeros, it it has it cannot be non-singular. It cannot be invertible. Um, so if if it if if it so happens that one of these um, sums is equal to zero, then there, there's no use in even finding a unique solution to um, this, then, then there is no minimum to this formula. Uh, there is no minimum to the residual sum of squares. We can only find a minimum when this matrix is, when this matrix product is non-singular, in which case it's given by this formula. And the fact that this is non-singular guarantees that all of these sums are strictly greater than zero, which means that the function is concave up in every single coordinate, which means that um, this solution, because re remember this solution is the critical point that we computed earlier, it means that this must be a local minimum because, well, I guess, Really, it would be a global minimum here, but at the very least, it's a local minimum. Um, it's a minimum because it is strictly concave up in every single coordinate. Um, the function, the residual, the residual sum of squares function evaluated at this point beta is going to be concave up in every one of these, um, in every one of the coordinates. All right, so that confirms that um, this is a unique solution which minimizes the residual sum of squares. And that's what we were looking to prove, and so we're done.